All right, well, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Jeff Cowie. I'm uh, in the department here, here at Vanderbilt University. Don't move. Yeah, no kidding. Mm. Are we alive? Jeez, the weed. <laughs> it's your Hendrix moment. You're not supposed to sit on the thing. <laughs> Don't sit yeah, on the good? thing. <laughs> you can't sit on the thing. Come on. It's in. It's in. Try it again. I don't, I'm not being, am I being No. All right. No. Um, anyway, I'm Jeff Dowie, anyway. Um, and I'm in the history department here at Vanderbilt. I want to say some quick thanks, some quick introductions, and get into what we all came here for. Uh, big thanks to the, my, my home here at Vanderbilt, the Department of History. Uh, here, Heidi Welsh, right here in the front row. Thank you very much for coming <laughs> uh, My chair, Joel Harrington, has been uh, quite supportive. The Dean of Arts and Sciences, Lori Benton. Uh, Alex Jacobs back there, who's been uh, working the back of the shop for us. Uh, the the uh, tech squad coming with the microphone. Working before. Okay. Uh, turn me down a little bit. Hmm. She can't, uh, she's and this class, this uh, this symposium is connected to a class I've been teaching, a uh, small seminar, writing seminar called Body, Mind, and Soul. And I want to thank the students for coming out and for uh, a great semester so far. It's been a lot of fun, and we had a great session today with these guys in the class. So special thanks to. Uh, the students, and most importantly, for all y'all, as they apparently say down here, uh, for coming. Um, and there was all the behind the scenes work that goes into an event like this, but I don't think anybody really understands how much work goes on. For instance, uh, we had to convince Bruce to release his autobiography last month. <laughs> and that, and the Nobel that was Committee was... No, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, 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 you're yeah. jumping my lines, man. Sorry. Um, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, we got him to uh, agree sure. to star in uh, the Sam Phillips biopic based on um, Peter Guralnik's, uh fantastic book on, on Sam Phillips. Uh, what, else, what else have we done? Uh, yeah, we had to fix the Nobel Prize Committee to get uh, Dylan the Nobel Prize. Um, and finally, we had to make sure the Cubs weren't playing. <laughs> so we're here tonight to think about, discuss that mystery train of rock and roll, uh, and look into the key, some of the key figures who rode the train, drove the train, um, and I can't tell you how honored and excited I am to have these uh, guys with me here tonight. Peter Gronick, first here to my right, needs very little introduction to the Vanderbilt community. I had to pull him out of uh, schmoozing with everybody to get him on stage. I, we all know his books, uh, Last Train to Memphis and Careless Love, the pri prize-winning uh, two-volume biography of Elvis, Dream Boogie, The Triumph of Sam Cooke, uh, among many other books, and most recently his amazing biography of Sam Phillips. I think the critic Nat Hentoff said it best, and most succinctly, that Peter is, quote, a national resource. Next to my right, Elijah Wald, uh, he toured as a uh, working musician, as a real deadline journalist before turning to music writing, beginning with the biography of the folks blues singer uh, Josh White. Uh, and his subject matters have spiraled in all sorts of directions, mixing and corridos, narco corridos, uh, a great demythologizing portrait of Robert Johnson, and the provocative How the Beatles Destroyed Rock and Roll, which he revealed to, <laughs> which he revealed to us today was titled To Sell Books. Um, not to be outdone by Peter, he too has had a movie made after one of his books. Uh, the Coen Brothers Inside Lewin Davis uh, was uh, based on his biography of David Von Ronk. And he's here with us tonight mostly because of his most recent book, a fantastic read, very insightful, beautiful piece. Dylan Goes Electric, Newport Seeger Dylan in the Night That Split the Sixties. Finally, Peter Ames, Carlin, uh, uh, furthest to the right, uh, I'm sure not speaking politically, but geographically, was also a deadline journalist before turning to rock writing. Uh, he, and he has since been churning out great rock and roll biographies since his first outing, K 
Catch a Wave, uh, The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of the Beach Boys' Brian Wilson, followed by Paul McCartney, A Life, and, and just out and receiving excellent reviews is his Homeward Bound, The Life of Paul Simon. But he's here with us today because of his biography of Bruce Springsteen, called simply Bruce, uh, which is widely regarded as the best book on Springsteen, at least prior to last month. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, there's books for sale out front. You can probably get these guys to sign one for you. Uh, I'll push them out there when we're, and when we're toward the end of the uh, evening. All right, so the concept is I'm just going to pitch some questions that we've been talking about in our class uh, a little bit. Most, a lot of these questions have been generated by the students, so I'm going to kick it your way. And I think um, there's a problem here. Here's four white guys talking about three white guys, um, all of whom directly or indirectly took their inspirations from African American musical tra traditions. Um, at times, the actual songs. And, you know, the old joke about the Springsteen show, there's more black people on stage than there are in the audience. <laughs> I think... Um, there being one black one, person one, on yeah, stage. Yeah, the sax yeah. player, yeah. <laughs> Let, let's uh, be clear about how yeah, that yeah. joke works. <laughs> um, I think holds true uh, for many of these audiences. So we have questions of performance, questions of, I think, um, we, we know that music is a product of tremendous cultural mixing. Yet there's this power dynamic going on where we are here celebrating these three guys, at, you know, my, my inspiration. Um, so I would like to have some reflections first on the question of race and power and cultural mixing and how power and commerce maybe works into some of those questions. And I think Elvis is the quintessential place to start, and maybe we can move on to Dylan and, and Bruce after that. Well, one of the students asked about authenticity, and I, you know, I think that authenticity... <laughs> 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 I mean, authenticity is where you find it. I think that for Elvis at that time, there really was no issue of authenticity. I mean, music was music, which I think it still is. But basically, uh, you, whether you had uh, uh, Jimmy Rogers called the father of country music, but as much a blues singer as a singer, singer of sentimental songs, or you had Bob Wills, whose uh, repertoire included everything in the world, or you had uh, blues singers who based a good deal of their repertoire on country music, or you had somebody like Chuck Berry, whose first song was a takeoff on a, what he I believe it was a hillbilly song called uh, Ida Red, which he called Maybelline, uh, or Rufus Thomas, who listened to the Grand Old Opry uh, every uh, Saturday night, and, uh, or Bobby Blue Bland, one of the great uh, uh, soul rhythm and blues blues singers, who was inspired by Frank Sinatra, Perry Como, uh, and um, Purcell Perkins from the Five Blind Boys. So, I mean, it, it's, uh, I, I just, am, I, I think that we get too hung up uh, on uh, questions of origin, because from the moment that these uh, uh, these inventions, the, these opportunities for the mass dissemination of sound of uh, of uh, image uh, existed, from the time that the phonograph was invented, from the time of the radio, you had every single influence invading every single corner of every single sector of society. So, you know, you had people growing up in the country, you had somebody like Dee Ford Bailey, who was the first black performer on the Grand Old Opry, uh, but who was, as much a, uh, who was as much influenced by growing up in the country, listening to the birds, listening to the trains, and was very much influenced by the sound of what was then, you know, country music. So I, I, I just, I think it's, it's a song, it's a, an issue with which we occupy ourselves too much. Every single, uh, from the beginning of, uh, the, from the beginning of the commercial exploitation of, uh, of popular music, which really began with, uh, Elijah may dispute me, but, you know, began with, uh, uh, w with the people who controlled the popular music, which were the song publishers, the intention always was to get the largest number of performers 
to record in every version, in the polka version, <laughs> in a, you know, uh, in a Ukrainian version, in a blues version, in a hillbilly version, it didn't matter, but to get people to record your song. And as Little Richard said, thank God for Elvis Presley, because he made more money because of the publishing, although eventually he lost the publisher, he lost the songwriting, but, or he gave it up. But the point was that he made more money from that because of the enormous sales of Elvis Presley. So you can't, you can't look for, uh, you know, absolute justice in any respect, in any, uh, and, it, and to claim that music is democratic is not to claim that uh, the country is democratic, that our institutions are democratic, or that they're not massive uh, injustices that need still to be righted, or that the civil rights movement will, must continue to go on, will continue to go on, until, uh, well, I don't know when until, I mean, I, I would imagine that there is no end to it. But that isn't to say that, uh, that the endemic issues of the music industry are, really relate in, in, that, in the way that people sort of seize upon it. They say, isn't it terrible that, Arthur, that Elvis recorded Arthur Big Boy Crudups, so that's all right. And yet, this was a song that had been recorded eight years before Elvis did, never sold any copies was dead as a doornail, and with Elvis recording of it, it generated a lot of money. Now, it turned out but that Arthur Crudup, Arthur Crudup. Well, but that, <laughs> which had to do with Arthur Crudup being screwed by a publishing arrangement, which was eventually sort of righted to a, to a, to a degree. That, so if we want to attack capitalism, and Jeff might give us free range to do it, that, <laughs> that's, that really is the issue that has to be dealt with more than anything. Um, moving right along. Um, I don't think we have to choose between race and capitalism. I think we can be annoyed with both racism and capitalism. Um, we get I, deep fast here. <laughs> I, I would note that, you know, similarly, Hank Williams, you know, Hank Williams' cold, cold heart was not a hit for Hank Williams. It was a hit for Tony Bennett. We tend to forget that in terms of the big record sales. Mm -hmm. um, but since I'm here tonight as the Dylan guy, I will first note that Aside from our moderator, we are not only white people on this stage. We are Jewish people on this stage, all three of us. And for Dylan, certainly, blackness was a huge deal. I mean, for Dylan, growing up in Hibbing, Minnesota, as one of the, if he wasn't the only Jewish family, one of the very few Jewish families in Hibbing, um, for a lot of Jews, the option of being white was not entirely available, and the option of being black was a way of assimilating to American culture. And Dylan discovered black music, and the f earliest tape we have of Dylan is him saying, Clyde McFadder and Little Richard are the real guys. Elvis Presley and the Diamonds are not. Um, and when he got into folk music, interestingly enough, he starts by covering Odetta and Leon Bibb, and to a lesser extent, Harry Belafonte. People make a big thing of his Woody Guthrie thing, but the two Woody Guthrie things on his Minnesota tapes are the two that Odetta had recorded. And he got to that via having been an R&B nut and proceeded to have a series of black girlfriends. And whatever we may say about appropriation or not appropriation, certainly blackness to him was intensely part of what mattered in the music he cared about. When Springsteen was um, about 19, 20 years old, he had a friend who, um, who had, whose family owned a movie theater. And uh, Bruce is a big movie fan, and so he would go see the shows. And then afterwards, he'd help his buddy clean, you know, sweep up the popcorn. And when that was over, then the guy had all these reels, these performance reels of musicians, you know, rock bands doing their thing. And Bruce fixated on James Brown and um, watched it over and over again, this performance film. And to the point where he would stand in the aisles and try to do the moves. And, and, and obviously noticed exactly how James Brown commanded his band. Um, and you can see, if you go see a Springsteen show today, the same moves are, are, you know, you can see exactly how he does it, which is exactly how James Brown did it. There's a, there's a cool video of him doing, spontaneously in the middle of a show, doing uh, You Never Can Tell, Chuck Berry tune. 
And there's a thing, it's a basic sort of 12 bar type of rock and roll song with the one and the five and the four. But at the last, um, the last go round of, of the chorus, it goes, instead of going, it breaks the pattern. Instead of going to the five chord, it goes to the four chord. And you see him playing it, and right before he goes, he just goes, and the whole band doesn't miss a step. It goes right into it. And it was just, it's that kind of, you know, and, and the drummer, Max Weinberg, said that he could tell everything he needs to know about what they're going to play and what Bruce wants to do by watching his trapezius muscle. Because he knows exactly, after all those years, how he's going to tense it up before he strums this chord, before he does this move, before he does something else. But black music is always, I think the history of rock and roll and the rock and roll music that Bruce grew up with, I mean, um, has always been inseparable from, from rhythm and blues music. Um, and the other interesting thing, um, I mean, and obviously Bruce listened to as much R&B as he listened to rock and roll as a kid because that's what was on the radio. Um, uh, and at, at one point, I mean, he always wanted to have black faces and black members of the band. And the band that recorded the song, Born to Run, for a period there of about six or eight months, was, it's a six-member band, half the members were black. Clarence Clemens, Davey Sanchez, who played keyboards, and uh, Boom Carter, who was the drummer they got to replace Vinnie Lopez. And that's the band that a lot of people still talk about as being the best ever iteration of the E Street Band. And even at that time, though, there was a lot of sort of unsettled nerves around Columbia Records about too many black faces in the band. But Bruce was having none of it. And eventually, Davey and Ernest uh, Boom Carter left the band of their own volition. But, but I mean, Bruce is extremely informed by black music. And one thing I noticed in his autobiography, which may or may not be the best book ever written about Bruce. <laughs> at this point, it's, the jury's still out, really. Um, <laughs> He says at one point that he, all, that he feels bad continually because he feels he's underserved the African-American community. Mm -hmm. so. Did Steve push him more that way? Steve Van Zandt? Into, into rhythm and blues? Yeah, well, no, into trying to appeal more to the African-American community. And I, I always got that sense, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it, I mean, Steve and Bruce sort of grew up in the same thing. They were both 90s, though. rock and soul. Okay. I mean, I think Bruce always, I, I think he says in the book that... Um, he, he considers himself a rock and soul singer, you know. And, um, you know, I think it's difficult. I think all the real important artists in rock and roll are hugely informed. I mean, you, don't, you just don't have to listen too carefully to hear the influence of African American, you know, African American music. I, I completely agree. I, I guess, I, I think we should end this here, but it seems to me that there is a relationship here in the way that the music industry works and the way, you know, fandom works and things like this, that it, there remains a, a really important racial question. And it, it, that the mixing, you know, everybody's stealing from everybody allows a certain innocence that, I, that I'm, I'm not convinced by. But I think we should move on. Um, we just finished uh, the section uh, in our class on Dylan, and a number of students kept saying, what do you think Dylan would make of us sitting around talking about lyrics like this and music like this in this sort of fetishistic academic way? And from that class to hundreds of other classes and dissertations, books, articles, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, corporate sponsorship, uh, uh, the, the Nobel Prize, um, I'm gonna, I'd, gonna, I'd like to start with you, Elijah, and to, and to think about the sort of institutionalization of rock and roll and what that means. Um, and is there, and what, what perhaps the artists would, would, would think of this? I guess the short way of asking it is, um, is there no escape from Maggie's Farm anymore? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the artists are by no means uniform on what they think of this. Well, we have three. Um, I mean, Dylan himself, God knows what he thinks, if anything, and if he thinks the same thing the next, you know, an hour <laughs> later. Um, I mean, the institutionalization of it, you know, I mean, he wanted hits. I think, um, you know, he was an extremely literate guy. He was doing a lot of reading. I think he, I mean, he clearly saw his work 
along with Ginsburg and Kerouac, as well as along with Woody Guthrie and whatever, I think it's important to note that Ginsburg probably was more invested in that than Dylan was. Um, but they were both, you know, I mean, Dylan, I think his position pretty consistently has been that all European literature you know, comes out of Barbara Allen and mystery plays and all of these traditions of performance of which he is part, at least once he started intellectualizing it. Um, in terms of what it did for rock and roll, I mean, essentially the argument I make in my book to a large extent is that the way people have described Dylan going electric at the Newport Folk Festival is that he was snubbing the folk scene. But what's historically relevant is that he took the folk scene with him, <laughs> with all of its prejudices and all of its pretensions, and, and grafted them onto rock and roll and folk music, which had been the music of the intelligent college student, serious music listener, along with jazz and classical music. And one of the weird facts I found doing that book is that the Kingston Trio made their New York debut in a two-week engagement at the Village Vanguard on a double bill with Thelonious Monk, <laughs> which sounds crazy to us, but that was one audience. Mm -hmm. That was a college kid taste was Thelonious Monk and the Kingston Trio. And Dylan brought that into rock and roll, which had been stupid teenager music. And the act of getting booed at Newport is the moment where rock and roll becomes, you know, the, the whole thing, it's like Stravinsky's Rite of Spring being booed in Paris. Um, of course, it's completely unlike Stravinsky's writer string being booed because Stravinsky's writer string was booed because it was like weird and not what we're used to and Dylan was being booed because it's pop and just what we're used to. But that comparison has been made ever since and is, you know, this is serious grown-up art. Mm -hmm. well, everyone, I mean, all of our artists, I think, are on, have spent their entire careers on major labels. I mean, I'm not, you've written about a lot more guys than I have, but, um, but certainly Dylan, Elvis, and Springsteen. Elvis had his first moment on a minor label. Well, that's yeah. true. But that's only because he was headed, I mean, he was, he was still headed, he, he wanted to end up on a major label. Mm -hmm. They're all, as Springsteen would say, chasing the pink Cadillac. I mean, so, so it's sort of an uncomfortable thing about, you know, it's like the great notorious Columbia Records advertisement, this enormous corporation in 1969. <laughs> with the, these big ads they ran in all the magazines saying, the man can't bust our music. Right. And no one is the man like Columbia Records is the man. I mean, and all, all the records were avant-garde classical records, incidentally, in that ad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK. So, so, it's, so there's an interesting thing. I mean, rebellion within a much larger sort of capitalistic structure. And a lot of these guys, I mean, Dylan in particular, um, certainly Springsteen. Um, they started out, it's like, you don't, you don't go into rock and roll music because you want to be sort of famous. I, Wayne Kramer of the MC5 said this to me when I was talking to him about Landau and Springsteen. He goes, that's a bunch of bullshit, man. Nobody goes into rock and roll to be sort of famous. You want to be the biggest <laughs> fucking rock and roll star in the world. <laughs> so, I, you know. I would just note that Columbia, that Dylan went to Columbia in part because they'd signed Pete Seeger despite the blacklist. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they paid well, too. So it was and they had win. no rock and rollers. Yeah. Notoriously. <laughs> All right, Peter, you're in bed with the industry. What's, what's <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just, I think so many of these things come down to the division between art and commerce, and there isn't a great deal, they don't have a great deal in common. I mean, it's, it's, uh, Obviously, there are vast social inequities. There are vast racial inequities. There are, you know, there is not to say that uh, people's rewards are commensurate with their talents necessarily. And this can go in many directions: racism, classism, uh, regionalism, all kinds of things. But the big thing, I guess, is, you know, I'd agree. I think with both of you, is in the sense nobody is 
setting a barrier to where they want to go. I mean, I remember talking uh, the first time I spoke to Muddy Waters and I asked him if he had any regrets. And uh, he would say, yeah, you know, uh, you know, he was getting all this recognition. This was in 1970, he was 55 or 57 years old, depending on how you look at it. But he, um, uh, he you know, he said, yeah, I just wish it had come sooner. I wish it would, you know, had come when I was younger and I could put out more. But uh, it's, uh, I mean, even in, in terms of who records the songs, who does this, it's, there's nobody who's saying, I don't want, um, you know, uh, uh, Lithuanians recording my songs. I mean, <laughs> right. it's, it's basically, it, and that's why I come back to capitalism. I mean, the, the, ra the racial element, I have no quarrel with you at all. I mean, I'm saying that yeah. th there has to be continuing protest, there has to be continuing activism, there has to be all kinds of things. But I, but I would say, I don't think that has anything to do with the music. And the, each, many of the artists ran up against barriers. The point about rock and roll was it was intended to be a democratizing uh, uh, element. It was believed to be a way of bringing down the race barriers, and for a time it did. It, it upended the charts. I mean, in the 60s, for the first time, you started getting what would have once been uh, simply rhythm and blues. It's topping the, uh, uh, topping the pop charts. Um, and you had all kinds of crossover from 56 on. Uh, what rock and roll did do was it enabled artists, independent, I mean, artists who had been stars within the world of rhythm and blues, people like Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Fats Domino, who went back to, I think, 49 with a fat man, um, uh, Bo Diddley. It enabled them to go from being what once have been considered race stars, ra you know, uh, to pop stars. Not as big necessarily. They may well not have gotten the, rec the full recognition they deserved. But when you look back on the history of the music, they are the people who stand out. Their music is the music that that has held up, and uh, that's you know that's what we think of as as uh, rock and roll. If there, I mean, but but again, it should always be remembered. All that rock and roll is is it's a marketing term. Absolutely. It doesn't describe any particular kind of music. If you listen, you, I, I think, uh, you know, if you listen to Elvis's That's All Right, which, you know, with a, an acoustic guitar, a lead electric, which is kind of a simplified Chet Atkins style and a slap bass, what does that have to do with what we think of as rock and roll? I mean, it's a music that is uh, cleanly, classically, and purely its own. And I think that's true of, you know, each and every one of the artists that we admire, whether it's Dylan or Chuck Berry. I mean, what does a song like Nadine, you know, what it, it's, I mean, this is just, you know, why, let's give Chuck Berry the Nobel Prize. <laughs> but I mean, how could you write a song that expressed more succinctly or more uh, wittily or, uh, you know, uh, or, or just more eloquently a picture of a whole world, or you never can tell for that matter. So, I, I mean, but, but again, these are all elements of art and of artistic aspiration. And it's true that again and again, people run up against uh, business barriers, racial barriers, all kinds of things like that. But I don't think that has to do with their aspirations or their ambitions. The aspirations and ambitions are unlimited and they're sometimes put to the test. Okay, from, from aspiration to inspiration, um, religion is a palpable theme in all three of these guys' lives. Um, obviously, young Elvis singing in the church and his spiritual seeking in the 1960s, and Dylan's dense use of religious imagery and his conversion in the late 70s, um, and Springsteen, whose Catholicism saturates his songs, uh, seems to actually make a faith out of rock and roll itself. Sort of one that seems to promise both individual and communal salvation, I think, through the, the uh, congregation of rock and roll. So I'm wondering, if you, starting uh, with you, Peter Carlin, if you could comment a little bit about uh, religious themes and religious thought uh, within the, um, each artist's life. Springsteen started his career just furious at the Catholic Church, having been educated by nuns for the first four, six years, eight years of his education career. And they were savage brutes. They, I mean, they really were. It was, it was medieval. Um, there was one nun, they, they would play baseball sometimes with the nuns who just lived in a house that was actually sort of kitty corner from the Springsteen house. And there was n one nun who would never, who would steal bases and slide with her spikes up every time, <laughs> just like as a matter of course. And they'd beat you up and lock you in a closet. It was all very old 
you know, I mean, unpleasant. Old school. Very old school. Super <laughs> old. Ancient school. Flaming yeah, swords, old school. And um, if you listen to his early sort of uh, unrecorded stuff with his band Steel Mill, there's a bunch of tunes called like Redemption and or uh, Judgment, you know, where the imagery is so sour and brutal against religion, just as this, you know, it sort of fit into his pattern of corrupt institutions. Um, but it was all, you know, it wasn't as deeply thought through, but it, as he eventually sort of got older, and I think a little more comfortable with the idea of religion, I mean, I think his, his faith now is much more ecumenical. You know, he talks about, and I think he also sees rock and roll in that same religious way. I mean, without a doubt, he talks about the, uh, buying old records and, and these old artifacts from rock and roll as having a certain kind of spirit power. They're talismans of a sort. And if you listen to his music, I mean, he, there's a very beautiful song he had on his record, uh, I think it's um, Devils and Dust, called Jesus Was an Only Child. And it just gets into the, you know, the sort, sort of prosaic experience of, you know, Jesus and his mother, you know, and her mourning over the death of her son. And, um, but it's extraordinarily moving, and I'm Jewish, so, <laughs> you, you know. Yeah, but I, mothers, we have this thing. Mothers, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's an argument. It's always been an argument with Bruce. I mean, he's always sort of come both from the fire, um, but I think as he's aged and mellowed a little bit and gone through a lot of therapy, I think now he sort of sees the transcendence more and, uh, and his shows play like religious revivals. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. The way they're structured, you know, and um, yeah, it's extraordinarily, I mean, it's a secular kind of religion, but it's, but it's obviously religion. What? Um, I don't know, boy, if, of, of the many confusing things about Bob Dylan, his you relationship the to religion. Slot, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, he had his Jewish period, he had his Christian period. Um, I would say that he does not think of his music in those terms. I mean, he very much does not. Um, he thinks of Pete Seeger's music much more in those terms. I mean, he, he has said, you know, Pete Seeger is sort of like a shaman. Um, rock stars aren't, we're just living out people's fantasies on stage. Um, I think he has very much turned to religion when he has done it as a way of getting away from that overblown persona that he feels like was forced upon him, not as a way of channeling that. You know, I always saw Springsteen um, fighting with the clergy and God and, and Dylan going at it just straight with God. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's, uh, I mean, Dylan never reacted against his bar mitzvah, God knows. Um, that's where he got his first Lead Belly albums. <laughs> <laughs> what, the 10 inch folk plays? Uh, actually, no, 78s. His uncle, uh -huh. an uncle at his bar mitzvah gave him a pile of Lead Belly 78s. <laughs> wow. We do that. <laughs> I guess, again, I, I take a somewhat different perspective in the sense that it seems to me that all art is about transcendence, and people find it where they, they seek it where they find it, and they find it where they seek it. And many of the people that I've written about, I mean, somebody like Elvis or Jerry Lee Lewis came out of the uh, First Assembly of God Church, Assembly of God Church, uh, as, and many of the gospel singers that I've written about, uh, the black gospel singers came out of Kojic, the Church of God in Christ, or variations, Pentecostal, the Pentecostal experience. And that experience gave free vent to the kind of passion that they felt, to the sense of transcendence, to a sense of uh, rising above the uh, world in which you live. But in essence, I don't see a lot of difference. I'm not trying to compare myself to James Brown. I mean, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I, I see you dance. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the point is that we, I, at least for me, that's what I look for in writing. I don't, it's not, I don't, I mean, I, I've never seen anything like James Brown's show. There's nothing that compares with it. Uh, James Brown's show in 65, 66, 67, all into the early 70s. I mean, it was a, an element of transcendence. But the fact that it resembles 
a religious uh, experience or a church uh, kind of uh, thing doesn't really have anything to do with the transcendent experience that you get from a show as, as far as, I mean, it, it just has many of the people, many of the, uh, I mean, you, you, you can certainly get the same thing from seeing the Mighty Clouds of Joy, the Staple Singers and stuff, but it, I think it's wrong to think of it as, an L, as a matter of religion. Religion is religion, as Jerry Lee Lewis would say, and what he achieves on stage may resemble that and may be an attempt to claim it through art, but it's, it's, it's different, too. It's, it's, it's its own self. So I think that, you know, for many of these singers, for Jerry Lee Lewis, for Little Richard, for, um, for Elvis, uh, for many of the uh, artists that I've written about, certainly their beginnings are in the church, but I mean, somebody like Bobby Bland, who take, took his in, much of his inspiration from Aretha Franklin's father, the Reverend C.L. Franklin, that's where he got his sort of gargle from, uh, and he clearly came out of the church, as did virtually, I mean, Muddy Waters grew up going to church. But this is not necessarily what you get in their music. You get just a conglomeration of all sorts of things, which creates its own form of transcendence. And that's why I mentioned before, with Bobby Bland, you have Reverend C.L. Franklin, you have the Five Blind Boys, and then you have Perry Como. And, uh, you know, you might have Andy Williams. And that is the creation of the moment in which Bobby Blue Bland gets lost in his music and we in turn are drawn into the vision that he has. And so, I mean, you know, again, it's just for me, the whole thing is almost summed up with that uh, Chet Baker, the name of his movie, the, Chet, the song, Let's Get Lost. I mean, it's what we're all looking for mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of aspects of our lives. But that's what art is able to deliver, both for the creator and for its audience, most of all, at those moments when it hits its true inspiration. But on top of all that, in terms of Elvis's material, I mean, gospel was mm -hmm. such an important part of, of what he wanted to do, and maybe didn't get it even to do as much as he wanted to. Oh, I think he did. I mean, I think that the point was that as soon as he achieved a kind of national fame, uh, he sang a Peace in the Valley on Ed Sullivan, he, wrote, he recorded an EP, which was influenced also by his publisher, by Hill and Range, who owned the copyrights on all the songs that he recorded. But those were songs that he loved, those songs that meant, and you can hear that. But you can hear also, I mean, I'll never forget uh, Sleepy Labee, whom some of you may have heard, um, who was uh, the, uh, the only uh, six foot seven, 300 pound basso profundo rockabilly singer of the same thing. There aren't a lot of basso profundo rockabilly singers. But he was down and he was from, uh, 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 smack over Arkansas, but he was down in Houston uh, working as a uh, road surveyor, and he heard That's All Right in 1954. He was 19, just like Elvis, and he heard it, and he recognized immediately two things. First of all, it's revolutionary sound, which it's almost impossible to convey today to people who are so familiar with the myth or the, you know, with the sense of Elvis as a, uh, an archetype or something. Uh, but you have to lose that. But the other thing that he recognized right away was the deep-seated uh, element of the church, the sound of the church, the kind of resonance of it. And again, I think this is not something that would necessarily uh, spring to mind for many of us, but it was, you know, it was underneath. It was that, it was just, it was the passion of it, and yet it wasn't calling up the church. It wasn't a, you know, a... Uh, it, it wasn't a reference to the, to the music. It was something that was ineradicable from his voice. And so I think that's something you hear, but, but again, it all depends what you grow up in. And all of us, I mean, everybody, I think, who is trying to express uh, themselves, uh, basically is trying to call up from the deepest well within themselves what means the most to them. And it doesn't matter what it is. If that comes through, then you're getting what would be called a soulful sound, you know, irrespective of what the inspiration is. Yeah, I, I completely agree, but there does seem to be a double move kind of going on as the music moves out of the church and becomes more secular soul. I, um, and, then, um, and then religion, or I mean rock itself becoming a sort of a religious performance, as, as Peter was saying. To, if we're going to keep tossing this tennis ball back and forth, um, you know, before that it moved into the church. I mean, gospel music to a great extent is adapting what had been happening in blues and secular music and certainly gospel by the time of the 60s is adapting stuff from secular music you know the 
you were saying that the Blackwoods brothers are coming out of the Jubilee Quartets, the Golden Gate Quartet. The Golden that, Gate Quartet right, that Elvis, yeah. was also coming out of the Mills brothers. Right, right. No, exactly. I mean, and, as did and, the, as did the Soul I mean, gospel as we know it comes out of Georgia Tom Dorsey, who had previously been Ma Rainey's band leader and piano player. So, I mean, I think that there's a tendency. Um, you know, part of the authenticity thing is, you know, like the religious people are out there, you know, and the popular world takes their thing. But the religious people are hearing the popular people as much as the popular people are hearing the religious people. There's mm -hmm. a give and take, always, always, always. Yeah. But but you mentioned uh, uh, Georgia Tom Dorsey, who became Thomas A. Dorsey as a uh, as a gospel uh, songwriter and performer, largely songwriter. But the point was of what distinguished, I mean, he really is, people often point to him as the inventor of contemporary gospel. And one of the, re one of the things that distinguished gospel as opposed to Jubilee was his bringing the influence of the blues into it. And, his, and the, in a, both not just the Pentecostal thing, which, which no. it evolved into, it was not, but, but this sense of personal loss, of uh, this personal feeling, uh, and uh, you know, precious Lord, take my hand. Was that the one that came from his wife's death, or uh, absolutely wife and child? Wife and child. So I mean, it. it so there was a there was a real. This was this was what around uh, the mid thirties or so. No, much earlier. Yeah. It's around. It, early uh, no, sorry, that's that's early thirties. Yeah, early thirties. But the, but the point is, this was a revolution which was later brought forward by quartets like the Soul Stirrers. But again, you talk about the Soul Stirrers and their inspiration, one of the principal inspirations for their lead singer was the Ink Spots and Bill Kenny. Yeah. Absolutely. And Georgia Tom Dorsey, as you said, was not much of a singer, but the singer he carried with him was Bessie Smith. Now, was uh, Mahalia Jackson because she sounded like Bessie Smith? Wow. So, I mean, it, it's very much back and forth. That's great. Any final thoughts? The interesting thing about I mean, rock and roll and popular music has always just been about transcendent experience. I mean, that's what the songs are about. That's what the performances are really about. Um, and yet, there's always this tension between Saturday night and Sunday morning. You know, I mean, you don't have to look beyond Little Richard. You know, the years that I mean, he's the most you know, flamingly uh, wild. <laughs> How are you going to end that? <laughs> Leave that up. There. I don't know what you're talking about. But, uh, <laughs> and yet also, how many times has he renounced it all to go back into just straight religious music? Well, and, uh, a number of times, but the thing is he's never, just like Aretha, he's never left the church. Yeah. I mean, it's not, and, but, but I mean, again, people differ vastly in terms of their embrace of religion. And when, I, yeah. when I interviewed um, Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis together, among others, uh, Chuck, Chuck Berry and Fats Domino also, it was quite it was it was the funnest thing in the world, but also maybe one of the most challenging. <laughs> but uh, Little Richard was going off on a, on a thing about how thank God God brought us all here, and um, you know uh, paying respect to God and how you know this was uh, such a momentous occasion. And and Jerry Lee Lewis, who takes his religion equally seriously, took great offense at this appropriation of religion for such a frivolous purpose and said, well, I don't know about you, but I came here on a plane. He says, but I know you, he says, I know you came on a bus. So, but I mean, it, and both of them are essentially Pentecostal, in, you know, are out of the Pentecostal church, have never left it. You know, whatever their struggles are, whatever their uh, conflicts are, they've given themselves over to music in a way that has sought to elevate both themselves and their audience, but they take a very different uh, uh, approach to it. Um, okay. humor. We need humor. Uh, humor. <laughs> <laughs> so from you know, transcendence to place, uh, some reflections on, on the importance of place in each of these artists' lives. I, it, I, you know, it's, it's so obvious when you think about these three people coming so much from sort of the periphery of America, which is simultaneously the central aspects of different parts of America, depending on how you want to think about what America really is. So whether it's, uh, you know, Freehold and Asbury Park, or, you know, Hibbing, or Minnesota, or Tupelo and, and Memphis, you know, the good ideas seem to be coming from the edges of of uh, the cultural system in a way. Um, so I invite some, some, some reflections on the importance of place. And I, I'll, uh, 
starting with you, Peter, because I think your, your, your first volume on Elvis just begins with this almost argument about place, right? When, when they're in that hotel, uh, and, and it, it's Dewey and, and, Sam, and Phillips. Sam Phillips are, are, are sitting there and they're talking, you just sort of feel the thickness of location in that. And I'm sure that's part of the argument you're trying to, to make about that book. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know about argument, but I... But I uh, that's what we do in my business, we make <laughs> arguments. I, I, uh, well, no, I think that Memphis was almost a character in Last Train of Memphis. It was a, a full scale, or it was intended to be anyway. The, the play, just as Florence, Alabama is a full scale character in the Sam Phillips story, which surprised me to some extent because Sam always told me, he said, you know, every time we'd be talking, and he'd say, you know, Florence is where it all started. And I'd be going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all know what happened in Memphis, but it really, yeah, but, but I think, I, 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 and again, I, I expect argument, you know, uh, from... Uh, we'll do our Elijah. best, Peter. Uh, <laughs> but, but in some ways, it seems to me that all of, them, all of this music came out of the South, and it's not without a, even, you know, both Springsteen and Dylan. Dylan hearing the music on w, uh, LAC, I think, out of, out of Nashville, but hearing this rhythm and blues come out of... Out of Shreveport. What, what? he was listening to was a Shreveport. Oh, okay. Well, then he was listening yeah. to the... Yeah, yeah but, but a, but. And it, it seems to me that there you have the racial element writ large in the sense, and this is the weird thing, that there was so much more racial mixing in the South than there was in the North, despite the laws which explicitly forbade it, despite the myths that were constructed to pretend that uh, the South was not a mixed race society, which persists to this day. I mean, it's clear it's a mixed race society in so many different ways, not necessarily by uh, intention, but by you know, by actuality. But you had, you know, black and white living uh, cheek by jowl in the South. In the North, it was a far more segregated environment. There was far more interchange in the South. And the idea that Sam Phillips had of Memphis being, uh, sometimes he said big lights up the river or just lights up the river, but it drew everybody black and white to it because it was the only place to come around, it, you know, from for hundreds of, well, that's maybe, I don't know how many hundreds of miles around, that people would come out of the fields, out of, out of the lives that they led, to find a more cosmopolitan situation. And it, socially, there was not the kind of, you know, mixing that you, you, know, you would expect in, a, in an integrated society. But it, culturally, and in every other way, you had this thing going on that couldn't take place in the North. Uh, because the North was uh, de facto more segregated. And uh, so, in essence, it seems to me that Springsteen's inspiration, I mean, again, I'm prepared for an argument, or Dylan's inspiration, for, you know, coming from the music, they weren't being influenced by music coming out of Passaic, New Jersey, I don't think. They weren't being influenced by, you know, music coming out of the mines in Hibbing. Uh, but they were being influenced by this music that, you know, has come to be called rock and roll, and, and it was fundamentally, it was, it was largely black in origins, but also a great deal of it was white. And Dylan, I think, eventually came to embrace so much. Uh, I mean, what he got through was not the only thing, but I mean, just so many of the different elements that had gone into the creation of a music that it's very hard to uh, categorize or separate. You know, the thing that always interests me about Dylan is that Dylan comes from a made-up place. Everything about Dylan, I mean, it's an imaginary place. I mean, his whole past, when he, kept, when he, when he got to the village, was invented, and, and they loved it. And then when, I mean, not to get to my other book, but Simon and Garfunkel, when they got down to the, uh, to the village, they were ridiculed because they were just bourgeois Jewish kids from Queens. Unacceptable. Dylan, on the other hand, was a, rode the rails as a child and worked in circus sideshows. Like, he's the real deal. <laughs> Except Dylan was a bourgeois Jewish kid from frickin' Hibbing, Minnesota. Which was, which was different, because like, there weren't a lot of them up there. Um, I mean, it certainly is true that, I mean, there were no black people in, in here. I mean, I've checked the censuses. There simply weren't. There was one Chinese family in Hibbing. Other than that, it was white, but white meant Finnish, Scandinavian. I mean, it, it was not white, white. I mean, it was very blonde white, but you know what I mean. Um, they were Lutherans. They were not Baptists or Methodists. The other thing was that the and, black people had but, common sense. 
Uh, and so they stayed away from the Iron Range. Yes, well, there is, there's the classic Henry Miller line, my people are Nordic, which is to say idiots. <laughs> um, but he was referring to climate. It's like we started in Africa, mine were the people who were so stupid. <laughs> but be that as it may, um, no, and he discovered this secret world of black music, and race was major. And when he discovered that there was a black DJ 50 miles away, they started driving out there every week to sort of sit at this man's feet. But the other side of that is that one of the funny things I found when I did the book is he still takes phone calls and remains in touch to the extent they want to be in touch with him with the people he knew in Hipping in Minneapolis, much more so than the people he met even in his early days in New York. I mean, he has a trust and a certain, you know, I mean, there's a, a thing between him and the folks from back there that he does not feel with the people who fell for the line yeah. when he got to Greenwich Village. So it, it, it seems that Springsteen and Elvis are deeply connected to these places, but, and you're, you're, you're saying that Maybe Dylan's more connected than we think, but, but he basically spent most of his life the, kind of yeah. trying to figure out where he was from. And his art like. is not connected right. in the same way, and it's not about the place. I mean, I should also say his girlfriend, Susie Rotolo, mm -hmm. one of the, uh, she was a friend of mine. It was not until quite late that I, realized, that I found that, I mean, Susie and Dylan still talked on the phone every month or two. Mm. I mean, he, one of the odd things about Dylan is all the weirdness that we have all experienced of Dylan, the exception to it is that the people who knew him before, mm -hmm. he continued to trust and continued to stay in touch with as long as they didn't talk to interviewers. Did you see the picture of the reader board outside uh, Hibbing High School last week? Yes. A beautiful, it's like that board where they say like, it's homecoming week or right. let's go bears or whatever, has uh, congratulations to Robert Zimmerman, class of 1959, <laughs> Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yep. So. But, but, but I wonder also to what extent, you know, every artist in one way or another will tend to mythicize himself or herself in their own minds. I mean, to what extent that contributes so that, you know, for someone like James Brown, he created a world in which he as Mr. Brown mm -hmm. uh, was someone quite different in a, in a way from the person he had grown up as. With Elvis, though, who never, uh, now first of all, had Elvis remained in Tupelo, and thank God Elvis got out of Tupelo, because this was a very censorious and enclosed climate. When he came to Memphis, this was like arriving, uh, you know, in the middle of New York City in terms of the cultural influences he was open to, and he grew up on the radio and he was able to make up to make up a, an identity, which was not, not like Dylan, which was, you know, mythic in that sense. But even from a very early age, he had a sense, I mean, he and his mother were both, you might call them visionaries, but they had a sense of a, of a world that existed apart from the world that they saw around them, and of a fate that was in store for Elvis. His mother believed in this as much as he did, but he believed in it totally a fate that was in store for him that he couldn't fully articulate or visualize and that was beyond the dimensions of the world that he lived in and that was entirely different. And I would say the same of Sam Cooke. I mean, meeting Sam Cooke's family, uh, he came from a highly intelligent, upwardly mobile, educationally sound, I mean, you know, family of strivers. But he stood out in a completely different way from them, just as Elvis stood out completely differently from his cousins, whom he kept around him, from the family that was around him. Uh, and it, it, there's an element there both of imagination and of, of drive and of, there's something there which you can't, and it, again, Sam Phillips is the eighth of, is the youngest of eight children, I think seven surviving. Uh, and you could find similarities between him and his brothers and sisters, and I know we got to know many of his family. But people say, well, what made the difference? The difference was internal. And it was a difference that simply set him apart from everyone else in the community and from everyone else in his family. In, a, in our class, we had a hard time nailing down what that was. And one of the students called it the special sauce. <laughs> 
Um, but so when Bruce re re uh, released his first album, he took that postcard and said, Asbury Park, right. this is where I'm from, greetings. Um, so I mean, that's either mythologizing or it's really a deep-rooted sense of place or it's both. Well, he came from Freehold, you know, 20 miles inland. Asbury Park was his adopted home. Um, and so he didn't really get around to writing about Freehold until really alluding to it on the river and then later in the Born in the USA album, he was much more specific about the, you know, the closing of the Karagujan rug mill and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, but the Asbury Park thing was, was also very much, I mean, I think he was rooted in that as a place because it was the stage um, that kind of where he sort of found his legs, where he found himself and he found his voice. And he, what he also found was the transcendent experience of playing music in front of people. And when you get to the album, um, The Wild, The Innocent, and The East Street Shuffle, the, the, you know, the title track, he talks about the East Street Shuffle being just sort of like the shuffle you got to go through every day just to get through life, you know, just to get the bare essentials of rent and food and a little walking around money. Um, but when they get together in the club with the band in front of them, you know, everybody form a line, you know, the whole thing just lifts off. You, you, you can sort of sense that club, you know, lifting off from the ground and everyone sort of leaving everything behind you know, together, you know, in that club. And so, you know, but obviously, I mean, uh, Fourth of July, Asbury Park, the song Sandy, um, very much about this sort of collision of sort of shattered dreams, but also with this ongoing spark of possibility, fantasy. Um, but, you know, one was crumbling and the other <laughs> wasn't necessarily a, a for sure. But so, I mean, certainly to me, it was that was a very important part of Springsteen. Yeah, I mean, to me, yeah, I'm from Boston area, and I mean, it's an area, you know, it's sort of. I mean, the fact that he was taking pride, you know, as yeah. opposed to like John Fogerty, inventing this mythic South. Right. I right, mean, right. I think there'd been a tradition of inventing a mythic South. Well, Stephen Foster. And yeah, yeah, yeah. going back absolutely to Stephen Foster and. Springsteen's claiming of New Jersey, mm -hmm. I think, was very powerful to anyone from the Northeast. At the sort of absolute depth of, of New Jersey's reputation, it was like Schittsville, USA, really in the popular mind. It was a kind of South. Yeah. I mean, it was a weird kind of South. Uh -huh. It was almost <laughs> given, but like, what I knew about New Jersey growing up on the West Coast, the idea that on their license plate it could say the Garden State just seemed like bitterly ironic compared to everything I'd heard before about you know, I mean, your image of New Jersey is what you can see from Manhattan, which is like Elizabeth, New Jersey, and, uh, you know, all the industries, you know, spewing smoke and... And your contempt for the people from there if you're from Manhattan. Right? Yeah. But isn't that kind of like <clears throat> William Carlos Williams writing an epic poem uh, called Patterson? Yeah. I mean, which is a great, great work, I think. But, but I mean, but so do you think, are you saying that this is a calculated... Uh, embrace uh, or simply a natural one? That, uh, natural. No, I think it's natural. Yeah. I, I don't think that, uh, I, I don't think that's the kind of thing, because Bruce could have as easily claimed the sort of modern beatnik hoodlum, you know, the, the sort of, I mean, and he gets into that on that same album with um, New York City Serenade and uh, sure. Incident on 57th Street. He kind of can romanticize that, but he's continually drawn back to, to New Jersey. And, and, and I think that that was just because that's where he was from and that's where the people he loved was, were from and, and that's what he knew. Well, and, and, and the shore scene, New Jersey shore music scene yeah. is so, so rich and so happy. Well, no, here was something that I mean, just occurred to me going back to this whole issue of authenticity is it seems to me one of the elements of authenticity about all of these artists is that it's not a voyeuristic take on the, on, you know, on the world. It's an, I mean, in Dylan's case, it may be surreal, but it's, it, you know, it's a full-on engagement in its, in its, on its own terms, and, and Springsteen in a different way, and Elvis, you know, also. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, you have people who will voyeuristically celebrate violence, say. Mm -hmm. They'll just say, you should have seen all the blood that flowed. I mean, you can see this in the movies a lot. And I, I think that's something quite different uh, 
that from the kind of uh, music and art that each of these people in very different ways was creating. I, would, I, I do think Dylan's the odd man out in this particular yeah, conversation, and I don't think his Jewishness is, can be separated from his odd man outness in this particular conversation. So how do you mean? I mean that there is a basic working class affinity with place that I see in both Elvis and Springsteen that I feel like Dylan, when he claimed that, claimed that by lying. Um, and I don't think he did that for very long, but when he claimed that, he claimed to be an orphan boy from New Mexico. <laughs> like you do. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> well, our boy, our, our friend Barry Kornfeld told me the hilarious story about how when Dylan found out that, uh, that yes, that the Ramblin famous Jack, story of Ramblin' Jack Elliot and Dylan falling under the table yeah, when he heard Ramblin that Ramblin' Jack, Jack Elliot was Elliot Adnapaz, Adnapaz. <laughs> a they were Jewish surgeon's at that. son from Queens. But yes. he was laughing out of the other side of his mouth like three weeks later when the Little Sandy Review like put out a special issue calling bullshit on Dylan because it was actually it wasn't Little Sandy it was, it was Newsweek. Was it? Yeah, that's what I Newsweek. It was first the Hibbing Daily News and then Newsweek. Yeah. yeah, no, Little Sandy wasn't going to call Bill Shot on him because Little Sandy were also a bunch of people. <laughs> I mean, they were of his tribe. Um, no, it was the Hibbing and What was the headline and, and Newsweek? Newsweek? Like, so-called folk singer in quotes, actually a Jew. But no, that, it, I mean, the, they were much more, I mean, the Newsweek thing was a much more general attack on him and his fans. Mm -hmm for being taken in and making a fetish out of authenticity when in fact what they were buying was something just as fake as all the other pop fans. It's legitimate. Um, and their big charge was that he claimed to be an orphan from New Mexico who hadn't heard from his parents in years, but in fact they were there in New York to hear him at Carnegie Hall with tickets he had sent them and paid their plane fare, um, which is a rather complicated thing because the point is he in fact was not running away from that privately mm -hmm. he had bought his he had brought his parents to see Bobby at Carnegie Hall that just wasn't the act he was putting on stage there it's complicated and I think complicated I'm, I'm not going to say more complicated than Springsteen and Elvis but I will say differently complicated I'm, I'm willing to go more complicated I mean in, uh, in the Scorsese documentary he, he says you know a person can't control where he's born and I was born there and spent the rest of my life looking where looking for where I should be and and that which is very different from this you know closely wedded sense of identity of place we see in the other two artists but do you believe that I mean he writes that in the book too I, he, yeah. no we're I mean, believing that. what do I believe I, it's but, Dylan I don't know I don't know. But the yeah. whole idea, of, uh, there's sort of a weirdness that, that, we're, that, was not really, that we're not really addressing of talking about authenticity in America. It was right. Like the bait, one of the most yes. fundamental ideas of America in the New World is that you're just going to, you can just you, start you invent, over again and become yourself. whatever Absolutely. you want to be. And if Dylan wants to be an orphan from, from New Mexico, and he can sort of Make you could be a Jew it. named Peter Ames Carver. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man. Yeah. Well, that's that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but uh, all right. Um, so I think what might be of interest to uh, <laughs> to everybody in the audience is uh, how you guys select your subjects. Um, I think uh, Elvis was an enormous, daunting undertaking. Uh, undertaking, and and I. I I read an interview somewhere, you, you said you, at one point you could finally imagine Elvis as a vulnerable, young, sort of Could I just quickly kid. say, Peter invented Elvis. Really? <laughs> for me, no. I, if, I, if it were not for... For me and for people my age, and a little bit older, Peter invented Elvis as a serious subject. I arrived, I was enough younger that Elvis had not jumped off the television in 1950-whatever. Elvis was a joke in a silver jumpsuit until I read Peter. And suddenly, wait a minute, this is something to take seriously. That's all. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> Well, 
Well, I, I guess for, for me, uh, no, and I, I appreciate that, and I, I, but for me it was, Elvis was one of a long line of, I mean, he was in the same, uh, I forget what, what, what I would call it, but it's like uh, E.M. Forster's vision of all the novels from all the ages gathered together in a single room, and Elvis, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Bobby Blue Bland, <laughs> Hank Snow, Hank Williams, uh, you know, it, it was all part and parcel of people, all the people I wrote about, and I wrote about Elvis in uh, Lost Highway, my second book, but that's, it's not that it's a mythic Elvis, but it was, a, it was Elvis from a distance. It was Elvis very much at second hand. And when I got the idea, I got the idea of writing the biography, uh, it was no different. The basic reason, everybody, everything and everybody I've ever written about, let's say everybody I've ever written, it's proceeded from my admiration for them, from, from my love of them, their music, from my passion for... Uh, for what they've uh, accomplished in their music and in their art. And it's all been written, it's written, everything I've ever written is an act of advocacy in that sense. It can be critical, but it's an act of advocacy in trying to tell everybody to, you know, come to this, listen to this, what, what, you know, go see James Brown, listen to Howlin' Wolf. Uh, you should, incidentally, you should all go home, listen to, you know, if you haven't seen it already, go to YouTube, Check out Howlin' Wolf on Shindig, introduced by the Rolling Stones. I mean, this is the next step in your life if you haven't achieved it already. <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is that, that I, it never occurred to me to be able to, to write a, a biography of Elvis. I mean, I, I, I've always, in each book I've written, I've wanted to do something different. I've never wanted to repeat what I've done. And uh, so when I re wrote Sweet Soul Music, for instance, I had originally thought maybe this would be a series of portraits, uh, of profiles, and I would have Solomon Burke and Joe Tex and Otis Redding and uh, Aretha Franklin. And then, uh, however imperfectly, I thought, no, I did, that, I did that in the last two books, and so what I want to do is to write a kind of narrative history, and that was the attempt, whether it was successful or not. And with the Elvis, with the biography, my thought, uh, it never occurred to me you could write a biography of Elvis, and then I was working on this um, documentary, which uh, came out eventually called Elvis 56, and I took my name off of it because, I mean, it, it's very much worth watching. It's beautiful. Visually, it's beautiful. I just had disagreements with its um, artistic direction, but and not the artistic direction, not the visuals, but, but uh, the the thematics. But, uh, but in the course of doing that, first of all, I was exposed to all of the photographs uh, of Al Wertheimer, who was just a wonderful... Uh, um, uh, what do you call it, like uh, Cartier Bresson, a, uh, um, you know, a it, it's a documentary approach, but it's, it's recording life as it is, I mean, taking the imperfect. And so, uh, and it not, these had not been seen, most of them. I saw 6,000, or he told me there were 6,000, maybe they weren't. I didn't count them up. But I saw these images. And then I also heard, I was given, and this is, you've got to remember, this is uh, maybe around 86 or so, so this is somewhat before the internet, somewhat before everything becoming available to everyone. And I heard all these, uh, the, uh, mar the couple who had, were making the documentary had gathered all of these interviews, which weren't very many, but that Elvis had done in 55 and 56. Uh, and I listened to these interviews and I suddenly had this thought, oh my God, Elvis can speak for himself. Because my idea always has been the only way to write is to write from the inside out. I never want... I mean, I never wanted to write something that just zoned in from outside. But, uh, and then the other thing that happened is, um, what you alluded to, it was I was driving uh, uh, down McLemore Avenue with this woman I know named Rose Clayton. Uh, McLemore is where um, uh, the Beatles made Abbey Road. No, it's, uh, <laughs> Booker T and the MGs did an Abbey Road parody, you know, with, on McLemore. That's where Stax Records was. So I, and I was driving down and Rose, who grew up in South Memphis, pointed over to, I don't know if the, I think it was boarded up, but it had been a drugstore, maybe it was still open. And she said, oh, you know, I used to go there and, uh, you know, Elvis would come in, he would wait there uh, for his cousin Gene, who was working there. Uh, and she said, you know, and Elvis, he would just drum his fingertips on the, on the table. And she, then she said, poor baby. And I just, in that moment, I just had this image of an Elvis that was, had nothing to do with the myth, had nothing to do with all the preconceptions that had grown up, grown up around him, but was just 
a kid who was absolutely, you know, passionate about music, omnivorous in his just desire to grasp everything around him, and, you know, was, had a face that was pitted with acne, and just, but it was that Elvis that, I, I mean, I didn't want to capture the acne, but it was just, uh, you know, it was that Elvis that I wanted to capture. It was just the sense of somebody who was freed from the shackles of myth. Yeah, How you doing? I'm fine. Good. Thank you very much. I mean, um, it's it's. Uh, uh, I think what Peter said about getting behind the myth. I mean, that's exactly the whole point of, of of I think these books that we write, is that there is that, that there's something very useful and something very important about the myth, and and the need for the myth, is is important. Un, you know, just unto itself, but that space there where sort of the tennis shoes hit the sidewalk. You know, one of the things that I found most moving about, uh, the, you know, the stuff I learned about Springsteen was just him as a, a kid, you know, as a little kid. He starts his, his book literally from the perspective of lying on the sidewalk outside his grandparents' home on uh, Randolph Street in Freehold. And he's just experiencing the world from that position, which we all know as little kids. I mean, that's how you learn you go around licking everything, you know. Someone told me once, I thought this was very wise, she says, you know, somehow, somewhere deep inside of us, we all know what a refrigerator tastes like. <laughs> you know, and, and it was that, and I thought that was a really sort of brilliant place to begin for him. Um, because it is, it just doesn't get much more real than that, being five years old and lying on the sidewalk outside your grandparents' house. And, um, you know, I mean, but the one thing I, I really wanted to say, without seeming like I'm trying to eulogize you, while you're still sitting here, <laughs> is and that maybe not the long. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay upright for the moment. Um, Peter and his and a, and a small handful of other writers, Grill Marcus and uh, Robert Criscow, John Landau to an extent, uh, Dave Marsh, invented a kind of writing about popular culture and about writing, particularly about rock and roll music, that had an intellectual rigor and a vision that no one had had anticipated, you know, that just hadn't existed before. It, there was a whole sense that, you know, rock and roll was sort of seen as entirely visceral, you know, almost anti-intellectual. Um, but what kind of came up through that generation of people, who are, all of whom are still very active and still writing and, and maybe intellectually younger than, than I am, um, is, you know, it, it's an extraordinary gift for the rest of us, because it was like, Reading those books was what gave me the roadmap for every word I would write later about the arts. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just very difficult to, to imagine a world where those pioneering books um, didn't exist. But, but, it, but that world did exist, and it was not that long ago. So, um, so I think, I mean, I certainly have, whole, you know, have a great debt. Um, maybe Elijah feels the same way, I don't know. I have a great debt. I'm not paying it, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the thing is that if you know, it doesn't matter who does it. I mean, it's just it's a question. It's always going to be done. And I mean, people have asked me, uh, you know, whom I admired as a writer, and I'm, I, I actually don't read that much nonfiction. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, but uh, you know, I've thought about it, and probably Whitney Bally is writing about jazz in the New Yorker, absolutely, who wrote in a very in a much more intentionally elegant style than I've chosen to adopt, and, and somewhat, you know, less idiomatic, probably. But the thing was, he was writing with great respect and with great dignity about people like Charles Mingus or Thelonious Monk or Duke Ellington. And, and the point is, this is always going to go on. I mean, you can't, it, it's, there's always, there are always going to be people uh, who appreciate, sometimes they may not be discovered. I mean, one of the things that it strikes me is it makes no difference how we respond to it, whether we discover. I mean, I, I, I thought about Robert Johnson in this respect, but you could say it about anybody. But I mean, Robert Johnson's a good example, as would be John Donne or Herman Melville. But people who are left uh, alone for decades or in some cases for centuries. And then to some extent, it's the inclination of those who discover those artists. I mean, in other words, when Robert Johnson suddenly became a platinum-selling, uh, you know, a recording artist, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which would have been, um, I'm trying to say, uh, how long after his death? Uh, 
60 years after his death? No, 50 uh, years. 50 years. 55. 50, 50, yeah. Or, 50, yeah. He died yeah. in 38, and it maybe this was around 89, 90. But the point is, and you, so you have the, you know, the, the box set of Robert Johnson's recordings sells people, and it's, it's, uh, it's the ultimate definition of a coffee table book, because it went on a lot of people's coffee tables. But the point is that the audience who discovered Robert Johnson at that point, it, it becomes, it just as every audience, it becomes very self-congratulatory. Look how hip we are, look how we discovered. It has no effect whatsoever on the music. The music was there all along. The music, if that generation hadn't rediscovered it, would continue to be there, waiting to be discovered. And hopefully this is true of, you know, the artists of today who may not be as recognized as there they, are artists, I'm sure, who should be. And, uh, the significant thing, I mean, aside from the whole question of remuneration and making a living and that sort of thing, but the significant thing is the, is the art itself and how, where it stands, how it stands on its own. And it, it, it's, not, it's not of significance that we recognize it. What's the significance is that it exists. Do you have any reflections on choice of topic? Elijah? Um, reflections on choice of topic. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm sorry. Ever since Peter ages ago made a reference to artists whose, uh, whose gifts have, who, who, whose rewards have been incommensurate with their talents, I, I immediately, you know, my immediate thought is unfortunately my rewards have been commensurate with my talents. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, on it, I, I mean, I said this earlier today, I mean, it, it is absolutely dead serious that I chose to do a Dylan book for the month. I chose to do a Dylan book because I realized I could grind one out in six months and have it out for the 50th anniversary of him going electric at Newport and that that would pay for three years of my life. To my surprise, it turned into a very, very different book than I had visualized and one that, in fact, I'm really proud of and um, that I found really interesting to do. But the choice of subject was hitch my wagon to a star. Because mostly I write about things, you know, that nobody... <laughs> is faintly interested in. And I mean, my previous book was on the dozens, you know, the African-American tradition of, of mother insulting. And I am equally proud of that book. And all the people who bought it could fit in this room without displacing any of you from your seats. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, that was the impulse for this particular one. But I think if you're, bi if you're gonna write a biography, uh, if it's not a work of advocacy, who wants to read it? You know, I mean, the, 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 there's a sort of school of tabloid books of just, you know, tearing the lid off of somebody. But I find those just enormously, just A, boring, and B, just disturbing. You know, I mean, and, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the key of it is, you know, I always go, I always tell people sort of like, well, you know, they say, well, how did you get to do what you do? And I was like, well, I, I found a way to monetize my adolescence. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like all the same. You and Springsteen both. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough out of you. Um, it's just getting good. <laughs> but it's that, that passion, you know, at, at some point in your life, something just resonates with you so deeply in one way, shape, or form that you have to, you know, the. The, the big statement that, you, you know, you go around, it's like part of the process. I go around looking for the book, like, where's a really great book about, the book I want to read about yeah. this person or that person? And if it doesn't exist, you know, if you've, got a, if you've got a laptop, you've got one, and, you know, and time to kill, you've got one choice. You know, you've got to go out and write it. Yep. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's totally true. And I mean, I, the first two interviews I did were with Henry Green, the British novelist, when I was 19 and Skip James, which a year or two later, and both were just because I had, I had no, nothing to do with this. I had, there was nothing, there was no impulse other than in, in my, my admiration for them and my sense that greatness such as this will not pass my, uh, you know, way again. But, um, 
Well, anyway, I, I mean, it, 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 well, I, I forget. I had some some uh, just really snappy repartee. To <laughs> 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 uh, one one closing thing that sort of hang in the air for me, and then um, we're we're almost out of time. That is, if it has to be advocacy, doesn't that steer us away from the darker parts no. of no. ourselves? No, absolutely, absolutely not. not. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll heartily concur. <laughs> it gets you deeper into the darker parts because the beautiful thing is the story of how the redemption is the music or the art to some degree. I mean, when it's at its best, but you can't describe, you can't advocate it at its best when some of it, if some of it just flat out sucks, then you've got to say that. Or if somebody is sort of a, a you know, acts in ways that, that, don't live up to anyone's standards of, of, of ethics and morals, then you got to say that. Redemption requires sin. Yeah. That's yeah. what Mike Pence says. I guess what I'm... <laughs> Little Richard, too. I guess what I'm thinking about here is more is in terms of choice of topic, not in terms yeah. of how you guys approach these three artists or all the artists that you, 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 you've, you've talked about. I mean, have you... In any of your works, have you really... I mean, what, what, what are the really... What are the failures? Where are the lack of successes? Where the, where's, the, where's the place where hit, people hit bottom and didn't bounce back ever, or never saw the top? Like, you know, Elvis hit bottom eventually, but, but he'd seen the top. Um, it, it seems like the, we want the biography of the successful hero in some way, even if he or she's going to fall. Um, but what about just, you know, I guess maybe Von well, Ronk's mean, story is a my little first bit book was a biography of Josh White, who, yeah. who you know, right. had some degree of success, but it was not, a, it certainly was not a parade of victories. Um, it was a, there was a lot of very dark stuff there. And, but I, I mean, I don't think that's what we mean by advocacy. I don't think we mean Rafak and Becca of Sunnybrook Farm <laughs> by advocacy. I didn't um, mean to suggest you did. I, I, no, I, I think what we meant is something different, which, I, I mean, le, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you're serious about doing a biography, what you're trying to do is understand somebody. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to present fairly your understanding of what impelled them, and that is by definition. I would say advocacy. I mean, that's why Albert Goldman's books in the end are boring. Because he is not actually trying to understand these people he's writing about. He's riffing on them. Yeah, he's riffing on them. Yeah, no. I'm and and I, I mean, I think we're not talking about advocacy in the sense of this is great, we're going to say how great it is. We're talking about it, trying to get inside the story and make people understand how it happened, which is to say, understand that if they'd been there, mm -hmm. they would understand the dark parts as the much as the light parts. The real advocacy is for the human experience, really. Yeah. Because it's the humanity of these sort of larger-than-life people is, is the transcendent thing in a lot of ways. And how do you get from the point of being somebody who, who experiences the same kind of you know, prosaic travails that we all do, just trying to buy your groceries and put gas in the car, to having these moments of extraordinary creation. I guess for, for me, the center of, the, of it is the work. And that's, what, I mean, I have no judgments to make. I have a, there's a story to tell. And the story can be deep, it can be dark, it can be whatever it is. Uh, I don't have any judgments to make, or I'm not either condoning or condemning. Uh, and I'm trying to tell the story as accurately and with as much respect for the human experience mm -hmm. as, as I can. So, I mean, if you're writing about somebody like Merle Haggard, um, I mean, this, I always said that uh, up until the day he died, that the only thing that would cause me to write another biography and, you know, God help me if it happened. This is when Merle was alive. It would be if Merle called me on the phone and said, you know, Pete, I've been reading some of the stuff you've been writing, and it's not bad. You know, I think we should do a book. And I would feel compelled to do it, but it would have been 
a terrible experience to go through, but the point is at the center of it would have been this person who was called, or called himself the poet of the common man, and who's another person who could win the Nobel Prize if we were playing it. But, but I wanted to make one point about what Peter <laughs> said about this person's story has not been told and I should write. Because to me, it, it's not, there is no such thing as the definitive biography. And every one of you, it, it's not a question of reciting the facts, because the facts are relatively unchangeable. I mean, it's rare that the story has gotten completely wrong. And to take Elvis as an example, because he is so central to a, a variety of mythologies, every one of you could take exactly the same facts that I have, could take exactly the same research, could take the same... And each of you could write, would write a completely, completely different biography of Elvis. And there's not, no reason that all of those should... I mean, in other words, you, there's no reason to be intimidated by the fact that, the, that someone has been written about. It's a question of whether you feel that you have something fresh to say about that. And, and that's... Um, and, uh, this is the one element of self-belief in which I believe, is that you'd better believe in yourself because there's probably nothing else to believe in, which I know is a terrible admission to make. <laughs> but I mean, this is, what you, this, is, this is what you have to say, is your perspective, your vision. And so whatever it is you're doing, this is the kind of thing you want to bring to it, it seems to me. And, that, and that, that's, it's, I'm not quarreling with what you said, but I think on some level just that, that the, no, no subject is ever exhausted simply because it has been discussed. All right. Well, thanks, guys. It's been a good night. Um, and, yeah, go ahead. <laughs>